Uh, I'm going to talk today about change agents for resilient infrastructure. And uh, I want to thank everyone who has managed to join uh, this session online for leaving such a gorgeous day, at least in Christchurch, and, uh, and taking some time off to, to be on the online uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I'd also like to thank very much the Erskine program and the people in geotechnical engineering and engineering management who uh, supported my stay. Uh, I'm sorry that we had some of the problems that we've had with COVID-19, but I do believe that, that New Zealand has a terrific uh, plan, national plan, which is working well, and that within a very few weeks, she'll be back down to level two and, uh, and integrating and uh, interacting uh, on a very viable and important basis. Uh, I'd like to thank today also uh, some of the people who contributed to this research. A, a person like me can only be a manifestation of the work of other folks. So I act as a spokesperson for a lot of good research uh, that gets done under my supervision or with me as a co-worker. And, uh, and some of those people come from the Cornell lab and I'd like to thank them for their efforts and energies. I'd also like to thank the National Science Foundation in the United States which supports a lot of this work and uh, has been a, a great supporter for a great number of years. The collage in front of you is, is made up of four pictures. There's a two pictures that, uh, or excuse me, say three pictures that actually are dark. They actually come from the Hurricane Sandy effects in New York City. And then there's kind of a light one, which would be the representative of the Southern states, and that's New Orleans. It says, help us, it's people who are stranded on a, a, a a rooftop. Uh, we also could look at this as help the United States because uh, in 2005, I like to say we were one hurricane away from complete national disaster. Okay, so I am trying to go forward on the slide and having a little difficulty. I'm going to try it one more time, see if I can go forward. Mark, can you still hear me? Hi, Tom. Yeah, we, you're still with us. Okay. Um, somehow my screen has become frozen, but let's see what we can do to, to uh, undo this sort of thing. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing and try it all over again. Okay, so I now have the PowerPoint. You should be able to see it. And I have now increased it. And now, here we go. So the first slide I have is an iconic image from the Consolidated Edison Company of New York. It's the corner of Wall Street and William Street in about 1920, 22, 23. You can tell by the boater hats of the people who are watching underground construction. This is very much like what the underground looks like in major cities. We have the New York Stock Exchange in the background and a plethora of utilities that provide us with services and resources that are necessary to have a modern world. And you can see right away that there is a closeness associated with this infrastructure so that the damage to some of these electrical cables or some of these gas uh, cast iron pipelines or water pipelines uh, can rapidly um, go into damage for other systems cascade, not only within the electrical system, within other systems also. Uh, you also can see that, um, that we, like every treasure, I don't know how many people have seen Nicolas Cage in the National Treasure. In, in that particular movie, they buried the National Treasure in the streets of New York. And like, like every city, like Auckland, like Wellington, like Christchurch, the national treasure in terms of these utilities are buried underground and we can't see them. They're mediated in terms of the space between them by the soil. And uh, I'd like to say something that um, in the future, it'll probably be more meaningful for people in general to learn more about the inner space associated with the intervening places between these pipelines, these infrastructures, and the importance of the soil in mediating the behavior of these facilities. It will probably be as important to the general person as the exploration of outer space. 
I'm going to take this background and fade it into the topics that I will be discussing today. They involve global hazards, the World Trade Center disaster and Hurricane Katrina, uh, Hurricane Sandy, and then finally the L-Line Tunnel. Uh, I'd like to comment real quickly about the L-Line Tunnel and with respect to that tunnel, that was a project that Cornell and Columbia engineers uh, re-engineered about a half a billion dollars worth of tunnel under the East River for the governor of New York State, uh, Andrew Cuomo. And uh, what you see, um, uh, what you'll be seeing is a little bit of a case history about that re-engineering for the governor. He appeared on, on some of the slides that I showed in the beginning. And it's quite timely because on Monday, he actually came out with a press conference. And I think uh, access to that press conference has been made available to the viewers. And you can learn a little bit more with respect to going to the various websites that are made available and seeing the press conference and the photographs of the tunnel construction uh, and the actual press conference content itself. So let's get started with the topics of global hazards. Um, the world is as dynamic as it has been for millions of years. That's not changed very much, but what is dynamic uh, in addition to the uh, tectonic and seismic energies that affect the crust of the globe, what is, what is changing always is the population. It's dynamic. You can see here the population of the world from about 1950 to 2000, and it's, it's indicated or projected to go uh, to about uh, population densities of on the order of nine and a half billion by 2050 and, and maybe 10 billion uh, by uh, 2010 uh, to 2100. Um, what we can see is that the population shifts. And for example, people have moved into locations in great numbers that are tectonically or seismically active, and that's put them at risk. People have also moved to the seacoast in great numbers, and we have uh, tremendous uh, influxes in terms of threats associated with sea level rise and storms uh, that, that all of a sudden raise the level of the sea and, and have effect on these people. So if we were to look at the Sea of Mamara in Turkey, say for example, that's just south of Istanbul, uh, and uh, during the 1970s, the population has increased to 2020 about threefold because people have moved into this area. They have, of course, affected significantly by the Northern Anatolian Fault. So the dynamism of the Earth doesn't change so much as the people move into the areas where the dynamic effects are available, and that's increasing the hazard. We also have global warming projections, and uh, by 2100, those can bring average temperature rises anywhere from 2 degrees centigrade to 5 degrees centigrade. And along with those uh, comes the heat engines associated with hurricanes or typhoons or cyclones, as they're called here, uh, that, that gather their energy from the heated ocean top, uh, probably the first six meters or so, and uh, generate large uh, machines of, uh, of, of very energetic weather and uh, create threats in terms of storms, in terms of sea level rise because of the melting of the glaciers. And that, of course, has a global trend and a global effect. We can actually count the disasters and, and, and in some way call them disaster du jour. If we just take the 10 years from 2004 to 2014, uh, I've identified a number of the major events that occurred during this time. And uh, during this time, we had the 2004 Sumatra Andaman earthquake and tsunami. And this is the third largest earthquake ever recorded. Uh, during that 10-year period of time, we have the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami in 2011. This is the fourth largest earthquake ever recorded. And then we have the sixth largest in Chile, the Mali 2010 earthquake. So within a 10 year period of time, we have magnitudes of earthquakes, just earthquakes, just disasters associated with earthquakes uh, that usually took about 10 or 20 years to occur. We have three of them occurring within one 10 year time frame. Uh, clearly, disasters of this sort are likely to occur more so in the future. 
In, in addition, uh, some of these earthquakes have been associated with great loss of life. There's about 300,000 dead associated with the 2004 Sumatra Andaman earthquake and especially the tsunami. There's about 16,000 dead associated and about 1,000 missing with the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. And even the Haiti earthquake of 2010, which was about a 7 to 7.1 magnitude, with a forward directivity right into Port-au-Prince, um, a large number of people died because as opposed to having a poor building code uh, in Haiti, there was no building code. As a consequence, people built any way that they could get their structures put together and concocted a lot of structures with respect to the reinforced or unreinforced concrete that what they were using, resulting in a lot of people losing their life as a consequence of this disaster. We can also look at disaster du jour on a yearly basis, just taking 2017, quite, quite not long ago. And during that particular year period, we had three major hurricanes, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, and Hurricane Marina, excuse me, Maria. And, and that affected Puerto Rico. And we can take a look at the direct costs associated with these hurricanes, 125 billion for Harvey, which affected Texas, especially the uh, Houston area. Uh, we have Hurricane Irma uh, at $50 billion affecting Florida and affecting Puerto Rico. We have Hurricane Maria at 90 billion, some of the largest, most expensive hurricanes ever experienced. This is a picture of Puerto Rico before and after that uh, 2017 event, hurricane, and you can see the lights have gone out. They lost their electrical supply system and it took over a year to restore it. Once it was restored, they had a number of earthquakes that occurred in the southern part of Puerto Rico, which took out some of the plants and again crippled a good portion of the electric power system. What we're learning about in terms of Maria is how countries go back to the third world in the Stone Age uh, by having interruptions of infrastructure which have not been experienced before and which have changed the nature of the society. Uh, we learned a lot about floods in the Hurricane Harvey, uh, $125 billion of 2017 especially given the fact that many people during that hurricane were flooded in the same locations and floodplains that they had been two, three, and four times previously. So taxpayers through the National Flood Insurance Program, at least in the United States, are paying to reinstate houses and families for the third, fourth, and fifth time in the same locations. Uh, clearly, some major changes are underway and needed with respect to flood policy. The next topic I'd like to talk about is the World Trade Center disaster and Hurricane Katrina. On September 11th, 2001, there was the World Trade Center disaster. And shortly afterwards, there was the formation of the Department of Homeland Security. That department took as its mantra, as its central policy core, the protection of critical infrastructure and literally shut down access to information at a lot of different sites related to critical infrastructure. I was not a fan of this particular policy. Uh, number one, it prevents the 99.5% of the people who want to help infrastructure um, from actually doing so because it, it itemizes and compartmentalizes the information and makes it harder for utilities and for communities uh, to build back and to build uh, critical um, resilient infrastructure at the same time. Um, this policy has never really changed. It's still part of the policy complex that affects the United States and through the United States a lot of parts of the world. But it did change in one way quite significantly about four years later with Hurricane Katrina, and here it is, Hurricane Katrina, where the policy became not only the protection of critical infrastructure, but resilient communities. In fact, the DHS was able to identify the need to make communities resilient, 
even before there was a good definition of resiliency. And uh, I'd like to follow the definition of resiliency as one in which we build back or infrastructure bounces back to a stronger, harder system and is also able to cope with changes that occur during that period of time. This was the, the central policy for resiliency that was created under the Obama administration. So we have this sort of conjunction of protection of critical infrastructure and the creation of resilient communities, uh, which for at least the United States form the core uh, of the process of recovery and resiliency for infrastructure. And, and sometimes these two items are in consonance and sometimes they're in conflict. Uh, there is no protocol uh, in terms of the 50 states in the United States with regard to sharing information. And in some places it's sequestered and other places it's shared more openly. In 2005, we had many major hurricanes. In fact, as we're going to see in this talk, Hurricanes are an agent of change in themselves. They change things with respect to natural disasters, and they also change things with respect to protocols and ways in which we respond to natural disasters that not only affect flooding, but affect earthquakes and affect fires and affect all sorts of natural disasters that we have to contend with. So, so they're, they're kind of emblematic occurs across the board in terms of critical infrastructure. In 2005, my family had made arrangements to have a holiday in Mexico at a place called Expuja. The very first major hurricane of that season went right through Expuja and destroyed it. As a consequence, we decided to change the vacation location in Mexico to Cozumel. In August of 2005, there was Hurricane Katrina that entered New Orleans with, definite, uh, with devastating effects. There was Hurricane Rita, which came within about 50 or 70 kilometers in terms of the eye of that hurricane to Katrina about 27 days later. And then finally, at the end of the season or towards the end, there was Hurricane Wilma, which parked itself over Cozumel, where the O'Rourke's were going to take their second vacation in Mexico and as a category four, destroyed Cozumel for four continuous days. So not only did we lose the ability to go away that year, uh, the United States lost its abilities almost entirely to respond to natural disasters. As I mentioned, there were 28 named storms and 15 named hurricanes. I didn't mention the explicit nature of these things. In fact, there were so many named storms that we ran out of the English alphabet and we had to go to the Greek alphabet. I always joke with our colleagues from the National Weather Service that this was a Greek bailout of the National Weather Service. The next topic is Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy, a lot of people forget, was preceded by Hurricane Irene. Hurricane Irene occurred one year earlier and was one of two major hurricanes that went through New York City and changed the entire geopolitics of natural disasters. Uh, prior to this time, the US's favorite natural disaster was earthquakes, but one can make the argument that when Hurricane Katrina got into the Northeast, and that's not Katrina, Hurricane Sandy and Hurricane Irene got into the Northeast, that there was a major shift because there was already a political um, community behind hurricanes associated with hurricanes in the Gulf and hurricanes associated with the southeastern part of the U.S. Now uh, there was a constituency that was very concerned about being flooded by hurricanes in the Northeast. Hurricane Irene, some of the statistics are presented on the left-hand side of this projection, but it was still a near miss. Even though the New York City uh, had evacuated sh uh, and shut down the Metropolitan Transit Authority and the public transportation, uh, and all, even though there was record flooding, the hurricane just began to bring the water from surge over the tops of the 
East River boundaries and began to flood uh, some of the sections along the East River and in the harbor sections of New York, but not really seriously. Hurricane Sandy was something entirely different. Uh, it was not a near miss, but a direct hit. Uh, it killed about 160 people. What's really significant is the $68 billion of property losses primarily in New York and New Jersey, about eight and a half million homes and businesses without power, Wall Street shut for two days, record flooding, which we'll talk about, and of course, this directness. If we take a look at Superstorm Sandy, as opposed to being a hurricane, it started as a hurricane. And this is an animation of a hurricane which in the northern hemisphere spins in a clockwise direction in the southern hemisphere with a cyclone, uh, spins, uh, excuse me, it spins in a, in, in a counterclockwise direction in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, it spins in a clockwise direction. And generally, the hurricanes go parallel to the coast so that we're getting tangential winds that push up the water to elevations much higher than sea level and bring it on shore. But what happened with Superstorm Sandy, the Hurricane Sandy, was dragged by a serious low pressure system inland immediately in New York, and you can see this in this animation. And as it was being dragged, the velocity of the eye added to the tangential velocities of the outer bands and pushed up even more water, creating a greater and bigger surge. If we look at the battery, which is at the tip of Southern Manhattan, or as New Yorkers call it, Lower Manhattan, we had the surge coming right into New York Harbor, and it was significant. This happens to be the hydrograph that's taken by the NOAA organization uh, in the United States for the level of water at the lower portion of Manhattan. And what we can see is a peak that's about 14 feet, 13.9, we'll, we'll call it 14, we'll call it 4.23 meters. Uh, and that peak comes in on the two foot interval or the 0.6 interval of the tide. You can see the tidal variations very clearly in this hydrograph. And you can see that the two foot added to the 11.9 foot or the 3.62 meter surge and made it that extra 0.6 meters worse. This is a satellite imagery of the Manhattan area. You can see a New York City, you can see Long Island, you can see Northern New Jersey, and most importantly, you can see New York City Harbor and the Hudson River. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take this 14 foot surge and I'm going to add it to sea level and show you what FEMA was looking at during the restoration of New York City, at least the first year, as a model for what was inundated because of Hurricane Sandy. It's actually quite extraordinary. A significant portion, maybe 30% or 40% of the area of the New York City suburbs in the New York City area uh, was inundated by waters from Hurricane Sandy. And, and even though I'm going to talk most explicitly about lower or southern Manhattan, you need to see that there was tremendous flooding in Jamaica Bay, in uh, the Long Island portion at the right, and on the left hand sides in New York's, uh, excuse me, in New Jersey, uh, which had tremendous flooding along the Hackensack River and affected all sorts of port facilities and the distribution of fuel throughout the New York City complex. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you LaGuardia Airport underwater. It was a great concern to me because I used to fly into New York and uh, LaGuardia Airport. Uh, and also the battery, which measured the uh, hydrograph. And then we're going to take a look at Lower Manhattan and we'll show that in terms of the inundation. And everything along the shoreline was, was inundated and, and remarkably underwater because of the event. You can see the location of the World Trade Center. So this is 2012. In 2001, I was at the World Trade Center for the World Trade Center disaster. And here it was, uh, probably 11 years later, we're at the World Trade Center again with the new generation of managers 
in a major disaster associated with the hurricane. There's the battery, there's Brooklyn Bridge to put you into perspective. There's the L-Line tunnel, which we're going to talk about, and there's Broad Street. And what's important about the World Trade Center and Broad Street is these were the largest central offices in the world. They provided the telecommunications to the New York Stock Exchange, for example, and all of Manhattan. And there was double redundancy in the sense there were two of them. But the World Trade Center was flooded with this 14-foot surge, and so was Broad Street. In fact, Broad Street was so damaged by the flooding that it was shut down completely and reconstructed over the following year by Verizon at a cost of $1 billion. The World Trade Center itself had learned from Hurricane Irene. They brought the diesel generators up from the basements and put them in the seventh floor of the 28-story 140 West Street building that Verizon occupied. Unfortunately, that was not enough. Because of the fire department, the fuel tanks were placed in the fifth level underground basement of that building. So the fuel tanks, at best, weigh less than water when they're full of diesel fuel. And at, at worst, they may be half full, so they'll float unless they're tethered. In addition, there are fuel lines, and as the water comes up in the basements, it carries floatsome. It carries chairs and boxes and all sorts of things that aren't tied down and will bash it and batter it against the fuel lines so that unless the fuel line is armored, it will break. And that's exactly what happened at the World Trade Center. There was a special fuel truck that actually went to the site uh, and fuel was reinstated through this fuel truck to the seven story generator and the World Trader, what, what, Trade Center was re-energized and provided uh, data and power to Wall Street, the New York Stock Exchange, two days later. This is a picture of the inundated Manhattan on the left and of the New York City subway system on the right. And you'll notice a key station on the right called South Ferry Station. That had already, just by weeks, undergone a rehabilitation of a half a billion dollars and a 14 foot surge came into South Ferry Station. I'm gonna take the image from the flooding in Lower Manhattan. I'm going to make it opaque. You can now see the tunnels from the subway system that were flooded through primarily the South Ferry Station, but there were many holes, many hatches, many openings that the water could get into. What is amazing is we get 14 feet at South Ferry Station, and we get a number of subway tunnels that run from South Ferry to J Street in Brooklyn, for example, and 14 feet of surge, which is a 60 foot deep section of subway, in order to equalize the water, that 74 or 75 feet of water, it has to run horizontally or longitudinally along those tunnels a long distance to come to equilibrium thereby inundating and making those tunnels unusable until they're repaired. In fact, there were 13 flooded tunnels. There were three vehicular tunnels and there were 10 tunnels associated uh, with various uh, train lines. Uh, these train systems actually have two tunnels, an inbound tunnel and an outbound tunnel, and they're physically distinct. So Hurricane Sandy not only flooded 13 tunnels, which is often the official statistic you get, it flooded 23 physical tunnels. And there is a long, long tail to the recovery curve for 23 physical tunnels. In fact, the destruction of the subway system, it doesn't take much to make a network a non-network. Uh, the damage accorded uh, affected the subway system for many weeks after. In addition, there was a 138 kV substation operated by Consolidated Edison that had a seawall around it that was 12 feet. There was exactly 12 feet of surge. So it was well designed with respect to this particular disaster. Unfortunately, there was the tide 
So that an extra two feet made 14 feet and the KV-138 substation was inundated. And you can now go to YouTube and see the explosion because water and transformers don't mix very well. And that explosion caused the Consolidated Edison Company to shut off the electric power from about 42nd and 38th Street southward. So that all of these buildings became uh, isolated electrical systems. But they weren't working either because the, the, the pump stations were not with electric power from either Con Edison or from the emergency generators. And so each of these tall buildings uh, receives its water uh, from Yonkers, which is just north of New York City at the Hillview Reservoir. It's the balancing reservoir for the New York City system. And it only raises the water to the 20th story. So above the 20th story, there were many, many high rises in Manhattan that had no access to water, either for drinking purposes, but most importantly, for fire protection above those particular elevations. In addition, the Consolidated Edison Company operates a steam distribution system. Cornell actually operates a steam distribution system and gets its energy by cogeneration. Uh, Con Edison does also. It has fossil fuel plants that get heated on the outside and they take that latent heat and they put it into water and turn it into steam. Unfortunately, steam lines, and there's about 105 miles or 170 kilometers of them in New York City, are bombs. What happens is that when the cold water of the flood reaches the subsurface where, where the steam lines are, then the steam forms bubbles. And those bubbles then can raise in pressure and actually cause explosion of the steam distribution systems. The New York City steam system, as I said before, and the statistics have come up in the left, it's about 170 kilometers. Its diameter of pipes of about 250 to 750 millimeters. It runs pressures at 2.8 megapascals for the transmission and about 1.25 megapascals uh, for the distribution system. And it runs at a higher pressure um, uh, that actually causes the, um, the, the temperature of gas formation in the water to increase. And the temperature actually is about 230 centigrades. Uh, degree centigrade. So this is quite a serious situation. Um, it's not the first time there's been problems with steam lines in New York. In 2007, a major steam line ruptured on 42nd Street, right next to um, the, the train station. Uh, and as a consequence, one person died. And as you can imagine, steam lines, because they're hot, are coated with asbestos. So when they explode, there's asbestos particles which are discharged substantially into the air. They're eventually washed down the nearest ventilation grates for the underground, and the subway system quickly becomes, particularly in the stations, contaminated with asbestos, and people with moon suits have to enter those stations and shut down the subway system to make these repairs. And this has happened several times. It was avoided in large measure by shutting the system down uh, during Hurricane Sandy. So lessons from Hurricane Sandy, we have long tails to the recovery. We can protect tunnels against flooding. That's being done with lots of doors. There's inflatable objects that have been designed and developed after that hurricane, which are being implemented and are being used in case there is a future hurricane and flood situation. And it's not a question of if there'll be, it's when there'll be. Um, that will prevent the water from entering. So there's doors, dikes, and diversions that are being constructed. There's backup power for water supply on buildings. During a hurricane, there's no solar power because there's no sun, but there is plenty of wind power. So there's the opportunity to harness the wind to pump the water. And also, we're learning better to remove these diesel generators. A, a problem with the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant uh, in the 2011 uh, Tohoku earthquake also, I may add, as well as Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Sandy for the hospitals uh, along the river, uh, East River in New York City. So removing the diesel generators from the basin 
basements, but, but remembering to secure the fuel tanks and the fuel lines. The technology from Sandy involves unmanned autonomous vehicles, drones, uh, and structure from motion, which is in many places beginning to replace LIDAR. It's not going to replace LIDAR in all places, uh, but it's very accurate and down to the centimeter level and in, in being able to detect movements. Uh, these are flybys and can quickly collect information of importance. There's building information systems, not only for buildings, but for flood zones, for many buildings, for areas that are affected by topography and bathymetry that, that can be updated, just like any BIM can be updated by, by communities. Uh, and therefore creating a BIM model for flood zones that can be a protection uh, against uh, future flooding from hurricanes and from storms. And then of course, deployable flood protection. There's HESCO bastions. These are used by the military. Uh, these bastions are, uh, are reinforced fabrics, metal reinforced fabrics uh, that have been developed uh, to provide for protection against floods. They are portable. Uh, they are about four and a half feet by three and a half feet by about 32 feet long. Their, their, their fabrics uh, encased around metal uh, and can be filled with sand to create barriers. Similarly, uh, tiger dams, which are shown in the orange, uh, the, the HESCO bastions are, are in the image directly to the left of the orange. You can inflate uh, tubes and create barriers against water rise uh, by these tiger dams, which actually involve water uh, to inflate them. There's a couple of studies that come out of New York City with respect to Hurricane Sandy. One was authorized by Mayor Bloomberg. It's a stronger, more resilient New York. It's the best read I know of with respect to resilient infrastructure, and I highly recommend it. You can Google it by simply uh, Googling a stronger, more resilient New York, and you can download it for free. It's, it's absolutely astonishing. There's a more recent study the Lower Manhattan Climate Resistance Study by, by the current mayor. Um, and, and you can see that that's focused on the three and a half miles uh, along the lower part of Manhattan where the battery is located, where we've been focusing on. Uh, and this talks uh, about the hazard that's associated uh, with hurricane protection systems in Lower Manhattan. Uh, and we realize that, that hurricanes are really a matter of elevation that uh, in 2001, there's a six foot sea level rise potentially. And that means that almost 50% of the properties in lower Manhattan become subject to surge from hundred storms and that there's a groundwater rise that affects all the foundations. This particular climate resistance plan provides relatively inexpensive solutions to Battery Park City, the Battery and the Two Bridges Coastal Resilience Area there is a location called the Financial District and Seaport Climate Resilience System that can't be fixed unless there is an extension of the shoreline about one block into the water. The cost associated with that particular extension is extreme, over $10 billion. The rest of it we can afford. The central part of it, we're still trying to find the money. Finally, there's the L-Line, or often referred to as the Canarsie Tunnel, because the L-Line in New York connects Manhattan with Brooklyn and connects the line with the outer portions of that line, the last station, which is the Canarsie Station. So the L-Line tunnels, we saw a picture of them in the projections uh, from Hurricane Sandy. And it's about one and a half miles or 2.4 kilometers long. And it's over 100 years old. It was built from about 1916 to about 1924. It was built with, uh, with compressed air and with cast iron segments, the highest of technology during that day. And we can show uh, the actual Canarsie line on this inset diagram. It starts at 8th Avenue in Manhattan. It goes across uh, the East River at the L-Line or Canarsie Tunnel, and then goes out to Canarsie uh, near, near the Rockaways. And uh, what a lot of people may not recognize, but certainly the people in New York City do, is that the best bagels in New York City, and arguably the best bagels in the world, are cooked up, boiled uh, in Canarsie. 
So losing the O-line is not only a problem for the 350,000 a day commuters that take that train, 350,000 rides per day, it's also a culinary disaster. Um, in 2012, Hurricane Sandy filled the Canarsie Tunnel with salt water from the Avenue D fan plant to the North 7th Street fan plant. Why fan plants? Lots of water comes in fan plants because there's no gates, there's no enclosures, there's no stopping of the holes. Uh, and those flooded, those allowed the water in from the hurricane. This is a longitudinal view of one of the two physical tunnels. It could either be the inbound or the outbound. There's about 3,400 feet in the central portion that's inundated by the sea water. And then there's an additional rehabilitation that's required until uh, we get to the Bedford Avenue station in, in Brooklyn and the First Hour uh, Avenue station in, in Manhattan on the left. So you can see uh, longitudinally and, and size-wise what we're up against. And also we recognize that this tunnel is extremely small, varying diameter from 15 to 15 and a half feet, about 4.65 meters in diameter. And that means that there's not a lot of space to change your mind in one of these tunnels. When you rehabilitate it, you have to be very aware of what the constraints on your space are likely to be. So these tunnels have a train inside them, but the train rocks back and forth transversely. And what you see is a yellow boundary around the internal train inside the tunnel, and that's called the dynamic profile the train actually rocks back and forth within dy dynamic profile. And anything that's put inside that dynamic profile is gonna be destroyed by the train as it passes through the tunnel. So there's only room outside of the dynamic profile. And we can see that it's very constrained. There are two bench walls which serve as emergency egress, only one is needed, but two are available. And um, we are told that the cables, in fact, we know that the electric power cables for the subway ran in these bench walls. Now here is a close-up cutaway view of the bench wall. There's a walkway on top, there's a concrete wall, and then the cables are embedded. And as civil engineers, I was told, always told by the electrical engineers, never take the cables out of the bench wall because they will not be protected and they will fail. And I always believed it. Unfortunately, we had as an interdisciplinary team member, and I'll talk about him in a minute, an electrical engineer who actually looked at the problem and said, you can take the cables out of the bench wall. In fact, we kind of knew that because the hurricane, in a way, inundated those cables. The concrete bench walls have thermal expansion joints about every 20 feet. So they're cracks, and water does get into these cables and they're just like in concrete caskets. They're harder to repair uh, because they're in the bench walls. There's less flexibility. So what we realized was that many of these bench walls had to be demolished and reconstructed because the concrete was affected by alkali silica reaction. That means that there's amorphous silica in the aggregate and that silica along with the high pH of the cement uh, creates a new compound that increases in volume as it's subjected to water. It hydrates, it increases, it, it breaks up. Uh, we realized that we could reinforce some of these bench walls with fiber reinforced composites, and that would change the critical path for construction quite substantially by taking out the enormous amount of time that's required to, 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 to jack open these bench walls, destroy them, and replace them. We could take those which were not damaged very significantly and reinforce them. So much of the bench wall was planned to be removed by hand. It's a laborious, time-consuming process and to avoid that damage to a century-old tunnel concrete lining. The mayor, no, I should just say the mayor, that Basio is the mayor, that the, the governor, Andrew Cuomo, uh, convened a special group composed of scholastic uh, people from the Cornell University College of Engineering in the Columbia School of Engineering uh, to ask their opinion that could there be a change. Um, the 
rehabilitation of the Canarsie or the O-line tunnels was slated to take between 15 and 18 months and to require a complete shutdown of the system during that period of time, you can imagine displacing 350,000 train trips a day. It not only affects the community politically, it affects them economically. It's tremendous change in terms of people moving out of neighborhoods and restaurants folding and various other businesses going under because this ridership is no longer available. The members of this review team involved the Dean of Engineering at Cornell, Lance Collins, who's shown on the right, and Mary Boyce, the Dean of Engineering at Columbia. In addition, there was George Diodatus, Peter Kingett, who was the electrical engineer, and Andrew Smith. Smith and Diodatus were both civil engineers and were well known in the profession. Uh, I was part of this team um, uh, from Cornell that re-engineered the L-Line in about four weeks, completely re-engineered it, and actually saved all the commuter traffic, brought the tunnel project in six months early, and actually saved 100 million American dollars in the process. Our recommendations are shown on the slide. I'm going to leave this with the people that run the Erskine program and, and, and with Mark, and you can read them for yourself. But some of the recommendations were to decouple the power cable housing from the bench wall. This was kind of unheard of, but the bench walls were 1920s technology, and we now have cables that can be jacketed with zero halogen fireproof material. This is the third bullet item. And this has been successful in the airline and aerospace industry, and it satisfies the national fire codes. So you can bring the cables out of the bench walls, and you can put them on special fiber reinforced racking systems to suspend them. You just had to make sure there's enough room there to do this properly on one side and leave the other side for egress. And we were able to do this. We, we insisted on this being checked. And I may say adding or, or, or contributing to the academics on this project was the unabated assistance of the MTA, the designers, WSP, and the construction managers, Jacobs. They were all fabulous team players and worked tirelessly. We worked every day until the wee hours of the morning and got up early in the night uh, to make this thing better. So we left the bench wall where it was structurally stable and we fortified the weakened structure with fiber reinforced polymer wrap and strapping to reducing the need uh, and contextual fi fixes. And we removed the unstable portions of the bench wall, but what it was really looked at closely, only about 10, 15% had to be removed. This had tremendous repercussions on the critical path for the construction. We installed smart sensors, smart fiber optic sensors. They're now required in many tunnels in New York, and they were going to be required for the um, high-speed rail system that goes through Birmingham to the northern part of the United Kingdom. These fiber uh, optics are continuous strain gauges uh, that measure strains every, every half meter or so, or even on smaller spaces over the length uh, of um, two kilometers for the repair of these tunnels. Uh, and so they're, they're excellent at measuring changes in volume associated uh, with the alkali silica reaction, make sure that we're not having problems associated with this and also keeping track of deformations uh, on the egress way of the tunnels. We ought to combine that with other forms of measurement and once a day a special train goes through the tunnels with high resolution LIDAR that monitors and provides a point cloud of the shape and dimensions and locations of all the utilities and the bench walls and the, uh, the different portions of the tunnel. And if you subtract one point cloud from another you get movement. So we have movements associated with two advanced systems. Both have been proven, neither have been used on the same project exactly. Um, there actually has been some in the United Kingdom, but very rarely, but certainly represents an opportunity for the future. For those people who are looking into fiber optics, uh, we had some very world-class experts helping us on this, Kenichi Soga, Bronco Glissich from, uh, from um, uh, Princeton and, and uh, Kenichi from Berkeley. 
And uh, you can see that in the fiber optics, you can take a, a laser beam from both sides and where the lasers cross, they change or shift frequency and this frequency shift is related to temperature and to strain. And we can actually have dummy gauges take care of the temperature and therefore can calculate very precisely on the order of about 20 microstrain uh, the strains that occur in these fiber optics. This is called Brion optical time domain reflectometry. Uh, we could have one of the fibers break and still run the Brion optical time domain reflectometry in the impurities uh, related to the fiber optics. Uh, they've been used for London Crossrail. LIDAR and fiber optics have been used for measurement systems associated with the London Bridge tunnels. We had recommendations for resilience against flooding, and this required increasing the pump capacity, supporting some of the plans that were already in place, and providing for more doors and evaluation of flood zones. In fact, if we look at the crossing of the L line, in the immediate vicinity of the L line, there are these hatches, emergency hatches, manholes, and vent batteries that need to be plugged. And we did an inventory to be sure they could be plugged with mechanical closure devices, marine doors, watertight hatch doors, and watertight manhole inserts, all of which are shown on this picture. And in fact, throughout Manhattan, there's 2,300 different openings in the category two flood zone, that's three feet above a category two hurricane, um, that need to be stoppered, need to be pulled up in the event of an ensuing or an encroaching hurricane. We had safety recommendations. When you take out the bench wall, you create airborne silica dust. So that silica has to be monitored before and after the subway is open. And that was done. And not only was it done by quality control on the engineer's part, that's Judd Law Engineering, uh, but it was done by quality assurance by an independent contractor who did random studies working directly for the MTA and not for the contractor. All this means, all these solutions, all this integration means that there's no closure of service necessary with the new design. The work can, can be completed with weekend and nighttime closures of only one tube at a time leaving the other two to run trains in both directions. So from about five o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, um, uh, the trains are running in two tubes and that regards or takes care of the rush hour. Uh, during the 5 a.m. to 10 o'clock nighttime construction, one tube is left open and one tube is serviced, rehabilitated, resuscitated, re-engineered. The new design can be applied potentially to other projects, such as the Second Avenue, Phase Two, and the Amtrak tunnels. But one of the largest projects in the United States is, is completing the problem, fixing the problems left over from Hurricane Sandy uh, for the Amtrak tunnels. Uh, there's two sets of these tunnels. There's four physical ones, uh, both the east and west portions. And uh, they're operating now the commuter rail for New York, but that commuter rail shuts down because there are residual salt and salt water in these tunnels, which causes problems with the track, the signaling, uh, and the lighting uh, with respect to the operation of the tunnels, which are all needed for those safe operations. So fixing Amtrak and building a new Amtrak connection is part of the Hudson River Tunnel project, part of the Gateway project, the cost is about $13.8 billion, but these are single points of resistance. If they fail, there's no alternative. There's no commuter traffic into New York City. It's almost unthinkable for those people to get on the roads. I'm now going to come back to that iconic slide that I started the lecture with of the corner of Wall Street and William Street and I'm going to comment on five lessons that we've learned uh, from the agents of change for resilient infrastructure. These agents, of course, are the hurricanes themselves. In some real measure, they are uh, Governor Cuomo who instituted these changes for the L lines. But the first lesson is it takes a village to build infrastructure. 
part of the problem was that people forgot about the 350,000 writers. They didn't forget them willfully. They didn't forget them on purpose. They didn't forget them in any direct way. But the technology took over. And the technology said that if you keep these cables in the, in the bench walls, then you had to shut things down. And that was best for public safety and for operations in the long term. But 350,000 people is a village. And to build that infrastructure, you need to get your designs both socially, economically, and technically correct. There's a difference between change agents and agencies that don't change. And the reason I make this point is it's very easy to work for an agency that doesn't change. Maybe it has 20 years of experience one time. So that is 20 uh, years of one year experience over and over again, maybe 100 years. And the point is that there's a great opportunity here for universities to become partners with utilities. Uh, people always talk about communities as the first line of defense, the resilient communities that are necessary after a natural hazard. But the first line of defense is actually the utilities themselves, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the Christchurch City Councils, the, the organizations that have to put together, uh, back together uh, the infrastructure, especially the underground infrastructure, which is buried and unseen. Uh, and therefore, there's great opportunities for universities to become change agents for those agencies. At the same time, those agencies are at the forefront of the practical fixes. They become agents of change for the universities. It's a dynamic and changing relationship. It's good. Everybody should try to do this. The third item is innovation through integration. Our project for the L-Line integrated innovation. It integrated things that we already knew about but never used in quite the same way for quite the same project. So we integrated taking the cables out of the bench walls, putting in new cable uh, support systems, putting in new cabling sheathing according to fire code uh, restrictions and requirements, having optical fiber, having uh, LIDAR uh, measurement systems, having fiber reinforced composites, uh, having resilience against flooding circumstances, and safety for the airborne silica. It's like your cell phone. Your cell phone operates the internet um, with the internet. It operates cameras. It operates um, uh, GPS. It operates email. It operates all these things which are known technologies, but the way in which they're combined is innovative, it's new. And this innovation through integration is a definite approach to infrastructure that can help in future projects. We always, of course, want to build back better. Some insurance uh, relationships and, and contracts prevent us from doing that. We can only build back what we were with to begin with. And sometimes building back to what we had to start with it's not building back better at all. It's not building back, uh, it's building back to a worse stage because there's the repairs that, 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 that make the system that much weaker, plus we're building back what we had. So to the extent that we can change this mantra and build back better, we should try to do that. And the final thing is there's not enough liquidity in the, the traditional financing arms for infrastructure, that is taxes, uh, tolls uh, and, uh, and having bond issues. Uh, there's not enough money that, that can fix all the infrastructure that needs to be fixing. Believe me, I've seen the infrastructure. I know what the cost is and there's not enough money to fix what's necessary. So the situation should get worse unless we can provide for financial financing, innovative financing through public uh, uh, partnerships, public private partnerships, and uh, with respect to um, uh, uh, private equity. We need to uh, untap private equity. Uh, very often uh, that's done by consents, uh, by, by doing um, uh, various relationships with, with public organizations. So a contractor will build uh, and design and operate for some number of years, have a concession, share profits uh, with the owners, uh, but the owners, 
want to uh, protect the public. So they set some pretty hard standards. We now have emerging technology, which is the tiebreaker, that the, that the private equity can allow the public entities to build conservatively and operate conservatively, uh, but the emerging technology is what gives them the extra profit and the ability to do it. And of course, we need that community engagement to make it work. So those are the five things, lessons for resilient infrastructure. The, the final comment I'd like to make is uh, I was lucky enough to become the editor for the summer edition, that summer of 2019, of the flagship publication for the National Academy of Engineer, uh, Engineering, which in the United States is NAE, and this is called The Bridge. So the National Academy of Engineering flagship publication is available for free. You can go to that uh, website that I've indicated, or you can just Google uh, NAE, The Bridge, and you'll be able to bring up the entire volume. Within that volume, uh, there is an op-ed by Governor Andrew Cuomo uh, that actually talks about the infrastructure of New York City, which is unusual for a National Academy of Engineering publication. That's it, that's my, my presentation. Well, Tom, uh, gee, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I guess I speak for everyone here in saying thank you very much for a, a really interesting uh, talk. Uh, there are often things, uh, you know, when I, when I hear your presentations that always resonate with me. Uh, one of them is always uh, about the complex nature of real systems and, and the dangers of uh, hazards which cascade uh, across systems and, and create uh, unexpected consequences. Um, going along with this, I mean, the, you know, the issue of having systems which are originally developed in isolation and, and then having over time increasing layers of complexity added uh, as new systems get built uh, in the same locations uh, and the additional difficulties uh, and risks that it brings uh, to those original systems. Um, I think one of the other things that really uh, resonates with me is just uh, remembering um, the context in which uh, historic systems and structures were built, um, you know, and, and, and asking the question really, why some of the assumptions or constraints uh, that exist surrounding um, those original construction methods, uh, whether they still exist uh, in place today. It, it seems to have some very strong parallels as well uh, with something that Mishko has talked about in the past in terms of inheriting uh, structures and systems uh, from the past and all of the vulnerabilities uh, that have been built in. So um, I think on, on behalf of everyone, let me just uh, thank you again uh, very much uh, for delivering uh, your lecture. It was incredibly interesting. Um, for everyone uh, on the call, uh, we've got some time for questions. Um, I know Mishko has already uh, voiced a question um, over the chat and I'd just call on Mishko if you un unmute yourself uh, and ask a question. For everyone else in the call, if you've got a question, just stick your hand up uh, and then I'll call on you to uh, ask your question. Thank you, Mark. And, and thank you, Tom, for really a fascinating talk. Uh, I can only tell you that uh, we are seeing the, the the chat here and many people are, are sharing the same view that this was really a very informative and excellent talk. Uh, in relation to the learnings from the 2011 and 2012 storms that hit New York and your comment that uh, agencies uh, should uh, change rather than uh, repeat the thing that they have been doing for some time. So what are the major changes in the uh, approaches that the agencies took to achieve uh, more resilient infrastructure. Uh, and in addition to that, what else needs to be done in your view? What are we missing at this uh, moment in addressing uh, issues around the resilience of infrastructure? Okay, again, uh, thank you for the very nice comments, Ms. Guy. I really appreciate them. And I'm gonna ask, answer your question kind of directly with, with, with two examples, one in the United States and, and one in New Zealand. Um, with respect to the United States, let's take for example, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, which has very serious earthquake hazards and risks associated. They're, they're part of the Resilience by Design program that's, that's currently underway in Los Angeles, that's headed by uh, Mayor Garcetti. 
Um, and, and they, for years, have worked with organizations like Cornell. We're now turning it over to the University of California at Berkeley and to UCLA. Uh, but uh, for many years, uh, Cornell engineers went in there and completely modeled uh, the water supply of Los Angeles, all 10,000 kilometers of pipeline and uh, uh, special facilities and tanks and reservoirs and so forth for earthquake effects. And that led to a lot of planning and policy decisions and changes that the engineers at LADWP could, could get behind and support because it was really Cornell that did this. So they kind of uh, were able to take some of the responsibility, the direct responsibility off their hands and, uh, and put it on another group. It was an academic group, of course, uh, but it worked. And the, the synergy was, was quite valuable. Uh, and uh, to this day, LADWP has a uh, board of consultants uh, that have academics associated with uh, that uh, make decisions about the safety of all the dams around Los Angeles. Now, this is occurring with the uh, East Bay Municipal Utility District, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, etc. So, so many of the um, water supplies that are subject to earthquakes have developed uh, partnerships with universities and this academic um, business public works partnership is, has been quite valuable for the agencies. What, what happens with the agencies is that the academics push the agencies, push the engineers that actually have to implement this stuff to, to areas or to levels that they wouldn't go themselves. They wouldn't be as innovative. They wouldn't be as technical. They wouldn't be as, uh, as, as complete in their analysis. And the academics wouldn't know as much about being practical, wouldn't know what it would take uh, to make these complex systems work and what some of the complexities are. So there's, there's great trade-offs for everybody. Now, now, one of the places that could really benefit from this is, is, is New Zealand and in particular um, in Wellington. Uh, there's a terrific opportunity in Wellington where there's a lot of complexity associated with the infrastructure and that happens to be coincident with the nation's capital. So preserving the capital becomes an important problem in and of itself, uh, but it's complicated because there are critical infrastructure systems in Wellington, like the water supply, that, that have such an important effect. Uh, for example, the, the water supply is composed um, in terms of the distribution mains and even in some of the transmission pipelines, the larger diameter pipelines, uh, of older pipelines, pipelines in the distribution that are jointed, that might be made of cast iron, uh, other kinds of material that, that can break uh, from strong shaking, but also can break because of permanent ground movement, something that you know quite well, liquefaction. And Wellington itself is built up on many different keys, keys of filled in land uh, that was made to extend Wellington into the harbor. And, um, and as a consequence, a lot of the pipeline system is buried in very vulnerable ground that can only affect the pipelines, but affect fire and affect the, 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 the behavior of the buildings. And Wellington, of course, is, is well known for wind hazards and wind hazards create uh, fire spread. And there's a lot of wooden structures in Wellington that, that, uh, that are subject to this vulnerability. There's transportation issues, both related to the water supply and uh, transportation just to get in and out of Wellington, just to get resources uh, to be able to come from outside of Wellington into Wellington to get over this, this sort of um, isolation from the mountain systems that surround, surround the city. And as well as, as a rise in the elevation associated with the tectonic forces uh, of the airport. So, so there's a great opportunity, I think, for getting practical solutions going in Wellington and part of the process with academia, uh, at the same time with academia and the, the high quality and the concerns with academics stimulating uh, some of the utilities uh, to be able to do their job better and at the same time uh, be able to, to make the work of the universities better. Thank you, Tom. There's um, a, a similar question actually top, um, from Rory Green. So Rory, I'm just going to unmute you uh, and you can ask your question.
So Rory, yeah. uh, can you, uh, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, yeah, no, Tom, thanks very much for that presentation. Um, and I think this is almost following along your comments that you just gave, but um, uh, the examples in, that you've mentioned are certainly um, uh, in the range of larger projects. And so um, is there a, like a, a particular size or type of project that really lends itself to integrating the academics, the consultants, and the, the local uh, national governments, and then I guess what are some of the mechanisms? And again, I think you may have actually answered this in some of your earlier remarks. Yeah, you know, a subtitle for the talk, Agents of Change for Resilient Infrastructure, is, is, is one admonishment, and, and that admonishment is to every academic that, that happens to be listening, and that is, if you want to change, if you want to be a change agent, then you need to change agencies. And uh, it's just something that I've learned for many years of doing this stuff, that there's so much benefit for the agencies from having a partnership with the university or universities. And similarly, so much benefit for the universities having a partnership with a real utility. Uh, there's no prescription for it. You can enter into it at any size of project. Uh, actually, the bigger the better, but the bigger the longer it takes. And the relationship is not one that's bred overnight. It takes a little sweat equity to develop it. So you, you just don't phone up your, your local utility and say, hey, we'd like to, to share information with you. Um, it generally takes traveling to that agency, uh, talking with some of the people, developing a dialogue, and uh, over a year, uh, integrating your operations and activities with some of the uh, operations and activities of the utility. Um, and, uh, and this has been done. Uh, in a lot of good examples in the West Coast of the United States. I think, uh, I think uh, some of the Quake Corps universities have established good relationships with utilities and are on their way uh, to creating this, this change environment uh, by embedding themselves as part of these organizations, or at least as the, as the um, the arm of these organizations that, that has uh, some intellectual stimulus associated with them. Okay, so I think uh, the next question comes from uh, Ryan Moreau. Uh, Ryan, you're, um, I've set you to talk. If you wanna unmute yourself uh, and ask your question, please. Hi, um, I have a question. Do you think that if the infrastructure was more privately owned, that there would be more motivation to maintain it? And also, would that help with the liquidity issue? Because I'm guessing a lot of the infrastructure is the government owned in these instances. I think there are, are tremendous opportunities for private equity. I think that private equity ownership of all of infrastructure would carry some problems with it. And it like everything, if you turn over the operation to one set of entities, uh, you lose diversity. And I'm a great believer in diverse um, solutions, having several different paths that may go in parallel. So there's, there's lots of room for private equity, um, uh, but I don't think there's room for only private equity. Um, but there is not room for private equity, there is the outright necessity for it. The, the problem really lies in liquidity, that if you're going to fix the infrastructure of, let's say, someplace like the United States or the United Kingdom or parts of New Zealand, it's going to take a certain amount of financing to do that. And as it currently exists, the traditional forms that, that we build public works with really can't get the job done. It's going to leave certain infrastructure projects undone and if you leave certain undone, uh, then that's going to be a problem for the future. So you can ask yourself the question is, not only uh, is there infrastructure you can't afford to repair, but there's, there's some infrastructure that can't afford to be repaired. In other words, you, you have to repair it. And, and therefore repairing it by virtue of reaching out and stimulating some additional monies through private equity through the public-private partnerships, through the concessions, uh, through the infrastructure banks. Uh, these are all mechanisms that could be exercised 
to greater extent, and they may well be. You know, after COVID-19, we're going to have the need to stimulate economies in a big way. And, and traditionally, the way economies are stimulated is through public works. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tried and true sort of solution. And, and in that solution, uh, we're gonna to have to be focused on infrastructure. So there's, there's a real opportunity here uh, to become change agents and a real opportunity uh, to, to find creative financing to bring in more private equity. Uh, following on from that, uh, we've got a question from Stephen uh, Crawford. Stephen, do you want to ask your question? Sixteen and is for a conference, and as part of that, I got to visit the underground construction for um, part of their underground system, and they, they had these big, heavy steel doors about a meter thick. And I asked what they were for, presuming that they were there for flood protection uh, for the Baltic Sea, which is nearby, for flood resilience. And it turned out it was, but it was also there for nuclear war refuges. So I, I was just curious, does New York have a multiple use for their underground systems in, in, in building in a resilience of a different sort? Yeah, if, they, if they're, they're using these, these watertight doors and hatches uh, to protect the underground um, from floods and at the same time do it for nuclear holocausts, I'm not aware of it. Um, you never really know. I, I, I would say based on what I know, it's probably a minor influence. Um, I will say this, that, that in San Francisco, they built a, an emergency control center ostensibly for earthquakes but it was also built to control some of the population um, to behave better. So these systems can have multiple uses. Maybe this is, as I could say, a, a good reason why you want a diversity of different owners and different sources of money so that, that the right thing is done for the public with the infrastructure. But, but uh, I'm not aware uh, of anything in New York City that's serving a dual purpose, but in the minds of some people, there, there may be that type of purpose. I don't think it applies to the tunnel system uh, that's going underneath the East River or flooded by Hurricane Sandy. Thank you. Okay, and I think maybe there's time for uh, maybe one last question. Uh, we've got one uh, here from Brava. Uh, so, Brava, maybe you want to ask your uh, very topical uh, question. Uh, hello, good evening, Tom. Thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, I, I know you talked about earthquakes and storms and the resilience of infrastructure. Uh, I wonder if you had any thoughts on the resilience of infrastructure in the current pandemic uh, situation. Um, we're all going to get uh, tested in terms of resilience, and, and we're being tested right now. In fact, the, the fact that I'm giving an online uh, presentation instead of an in-person presentation, which I would have chosen first probably, uh, in person and online, instead of all online, is a testimony to a certain amount of creativity and ability to be resilient in the face of, of forces that require uh, home sheltering. So, yeah, uh, academics are going to be resilient. They're going to be able to take advantage of online teaching, just like everybody at the University of Canterbury, University of Auckland, and any other university that's, that's, that's linking into this particular presentation is, is most likely doing. They're, they're learning how to project their ideas, their concepts, and so forth through Zoom and other kinds of telecommunication capacities and do these things. Sooner or later, in order to preserve economic viability, people are going to have to reconvene and have in-person communication. But at least for the immediate uh, exigencies associated with the uh, COVID-19, uh, universities are able to adapt reasonably well. As we saw with the Christchurch earthquakes that, that, that damage 
uh, the Canterbury earthquakes actually damaged uh, some of the university properties at the University of Canterbury. And it took a very long time uh, to get those repairs in place. And, and while they were getting in place, the same thing happened in the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, people had to move out of their offices and go to various different buildings, which, which all subtract from resilience. Uh, but it requires a certain resilience to be able to do that and to bounce back and to continue to do the good work that's being done. So I believe universities like other institutions, but having the special characteristics that universities do have uh, are going to be resilient, but there is a limit we can ask of them. And sooner or later, uh, some portion of the population has to get back to business. Okay, I think, uh, so there's one, one, one new question come in. Tom, maybe you can, you can take one more. Sure. Uh, it's from uh, Bruce Dean. Uh, so Bruce, do you want to go ahead? Um, Tom, I was just wondering how much of the old line was actually financed by insurance plans? Any? Uh, the old line by insurance plans? None that I know of. The insurance in New York, the yeah, New York State is the insurer of last resort as far as I know. Thank you. Hey, it's one of those things that, that when, when organizations get so big uh, and they have the potential not always the capability, but they certainly have the potential of bringing in so much money that it makes more sense for them not to pay a portion of it to some other organization that then goes through reinsurance on um, Gulf Islands and uh, places in Europe, uh, but, but actually rely on the taxpayer's money that comes in through the collection processes associated with the state. It can't happen everywhere, though. And Tom, maybe, um, so there's just a, another question come in, um, which I think is quite well linked into um, actually what you were talking about with respect to uh, dealing with politicians. Um, so maybe you can, you can answer this one. Sure. Ian, um, do you want to go ahead and uh, ask your question? Okay, so uh, maybe if I repeat the question through. Um, the question was, there seems to have been uh, little mention of elected officials uh, and what they elect to spend their money on. Uh, in Nelson City, there's been a report um, saying that some infrastructure, in particular the water supply, is in a fragile condition, um, yet the money is not getting spent in that area. It's being diverted to uh, publicly visible projects such as uh, building, uh, sports facilities um, and public meeting uh, rooms. Um, I guess the question is really how you influence um, policy, the people who are in charge of policy and convince them to spend the money in the areas which they probably won't get visible recognition for. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, voicing these issues like I'm doing in this talk or like many people like me are doing in similar talks in, in other locations, uh, being available, I mean, the Bay Area, for example, let's take San Francisco, has a great cadre of, of experts who regularly appear on the radio or appear on television or make presentations, and they get bond issues passed that, uh, that completely revamp the water supply, completely revamp BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, and bring about uh, earthquake protection in that whole process. Um, that changes the mind of the population and, and changes politicians. Um, there's no doubt about it that politics is important and, and that it, it's a lot easier to get this done from the top down than the bottom up. It can occur from the bottom up, uh, but it occurs easier from the top down. Uh, in New York, we were very fortunate uh, to have Andrew Cuomo, and the hope is that he becomes in part uh, the infrastructure governor, one of the 50 governors of the United States that, that becomes known 
more for the innovations in infrastructure than anything else. And uh, maybe this is true. And that would be a great boon to people. But, uh, but it takes uh, a politician uh, the ability to, to get it done more quickly. There, there's no question about it. I, I can refer, there's two things I can refer to that, number one, in, in, in Hurricane Katrina in, in New Orleans, I was part of a National Academies group that spent four years there. And uh, I was in and out of, of New Orleans about every three months for about three or four days. And we went through two mayors. We went through Ray Nagan, who was the first mayor. And it was because of Ray Nagan that all of R New Orleans was restored. There's, there's a new hurricane protection system here, there at a cost of $15 billion. And there's a, there, this new system can't protect against another repeat of Hurricane Katrina because it's just too big. So uh, this system can go so far and, and can provide for an additional measure of protection in New Orleans, but can it protect against all potential hurricanes? To protect against hurricanes, we have to get some, um, some, some uh, absorption capacity. We, we have to be able to absorb floods uh, with wetlands. And therefore, some of the land in New Orleans that, that is occupied by people probably would do better overall, this is a scientific perspective, uh, being given back to the sea and, and allowed to be a wetland and absorb some of the surge that comes in. This, of course, is a technical issue, but it's a very political issue because in order to, to implement the technology and the science, one has to social engineer and move people around at the same time. So the constituencies themselves elect people. They elected Ray Nagan, who chose not to do the scientific route, uh, but to do the let's repeople everything route. He is now serving a 10-year federal prison term. It started in 2010. Not that there's a, a necessary relationship between the two, but he was caught on... On, on forgery and on uh, giving contracts to contractors for reconstruction of New Orleans after the hurricane. The, the mayor that, that existed or ran against Nagan, his name was Mitch Landrieu. We, we also had presentations from Mitch Landrieu and he really got it. He was incredibly astute and uh, he didn't get elected the first time. Uh, the first election was postponed by Hurricane Katrina uh, they were rebuilding New Orleans when it came to the end of October and the beginning of November in 2005. So they had the, the voting in 2006, I believe it was in April, and Mitch Landrieu lost to Ray Nagan, but ultimately Mitch Landrieu served two terms as mayor of New Orleans and Nagan went to prison. So inherent in our form of government, which is basically a democratic form, there is the ability to change and there is the ability to do wrong and there is the ability to do right. So it is possible and we hope that that holds true because we do subscribe to our democracies that we will elect the right person eventually and they will be the agent of change along with others that are needed to get things to be different. Okay, well, I think, um, Tom, now is probably a good time to say, um, again, thank you uh, very much for a, a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, and, and indeed for uh, being very kind with your time uh, afterwards to answer the questions that have been coming through uh, from the attendees. Um, well, I, want, I want to thank everybody for, for actually attending. It's been Again, it's, it's too bad we all have to be sheltering and, and giving the lecture in this way. I would have wished to have done more here in New Zealand, but I'm very happy, extremely pleased to be able to do this online presentation, and I'm only too happy to help out at any time in the future. Awesome. Thank, thank you again. And um, just say a thank you as well to uh, all the participants um, who have been joining us uh, this afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, on, on the Zoom. And uh, maybe all the uh, panelists can join me in thanking uh, Tom for his excellent presentation. Thank you very much.